The Faith at Work movement is on a cusp, destined for great things. God uses people from all kinds of walks of life and all kinds of professions to advance His kingdom. Work is a crucible that God uses to refine us. Everybody's work matters to God. The only thing that really brings lasting change is the gospel of Jesus Christ applied to every area of life. Leadership is people who can take other people's pain and turn it into passion. Are you overwhelmed by Jesus Christ? I'm going to talk today about my least favorite subject, failure. And not just failure in an abstract sense, but my own failure. And not just failure in my business, but failure in my character, in my spiritual life. Why? Because I believe that work is a crucible that God uses to refine us, and failure is God's bluntest of instruments. So I'm going to give you a little bit of my background. Before I came to work at Redeemer Presbyterian Church in 2002, I spent 26 years in the high-tech industry, from aerospace in the 70s to the internet in the 90s. Throughout the 90s, I worked as CEO of three different startup technology companies, all about 100 people, 30, 40 million in venture capital. That same decade was also my first decade as a Christian. In particular, I want to describe the situation in the last company. We were an online learning company, leaders in the space. At the peak of the internet bubble in 1999, I was wooed by that company to come in and join them as COO. This meant stepping down from my role as CEO of a more established company, meaning we actually had a few customers, and moving <laughs> to this company that had great prospects for an IPO. They had the technology edge. Investors and bankers were falling all over themselves trying to take the company public. And the CEO was more experienced than I was. Let me emphasize, I was really ready to not be in the top job. But within a month, I started to see through all the smoke and mirrors. Underneath the glossy presentations, our technology was not close to working. Morale was terrible, and our beta customers were getting extremely impatient. Some hoped I'd come in and be able to fix everything, but the problem, in my view, was clearly at the top. By three months, I knew I needed to exit. So I shored up my courage over the weekend, got into work really early Monday morning, walked into my boss's office, and resigned. But before I could even explain why, he said, well, you can't quit to me because I quit first. <laughs> That was a conversation stopper. <laughs> I told him I'd be in my office, and when he calmed down, we could have a sane conversation. And I waited quite a few hours, and then the phone rang. It was the chairman of the board, and they said, we accepted his resignation. And they asked me to take over the top job. I thought, God, I don't want this. I didn't seek this. What is going on? Do you have some plan? Are you going to lead me and this company to some amazing success? I mean, that would be nice. Um, is it possible? I thought it, like, kind of like Mordecai said to Esther, that, you know, you are here in this place for a time like this. I accepted it, but I knew I couldn't do it without God. Over the next 12 months, we made really good progress. But at this point, 2001, the entire technology industry was in collapse. The bubble had burst. Our only survival was to be acquired, and so we sought some sort of a buyer. We found one. It looked good, but in the 11th hour, their bankers panicked, too. The deal fell apart. I had to lay off 100 people the next day, sell off all the intellectual property, 
and take the company through chapter 11. It was a nightmare, and all I could think of was, why, God, why? At this point, I'd been a Christian for more than a decade, and I knew theoretically that I was supposed to be able to handle things like failure better than others because I knew my identity was in Christ and Christ alone. But inside, I was angry at God. I was fixated with defending myself, and I was really anxious to redeem myself. That's what the next part of this talk is about. Angry and confused, why would you call me to lead this company and then let it fail? What kind of witness is that? I mean, do you even care, God? I took solace through of conversations throughout the Bible, especially the Psalms, with people just pummeling God with their prayers of anger and confusion. My own litany was heartfelt. But I was also busy trying to patch up my own career resume. My board advised me to quit right away so that it wouldn't show up on my record. I didn't quit, but I was certainly working hard to try to find ways to look good. In retrospect, I was neurotically trying to control my own self-worth. We all have ways of doing this. Me, I'm a high-capacity blame shifter. <laughs> Clearly, this company's failure was on my watch, but it wasn't my fault. The founder whom I'd replaced was eager to blame me, but I knew in my heart that he's the one that made a mess of things. Secondly, the entire industry was collapsing. So, I mean, I hate to admit this, but at some level, I was happier to see everyone fail than to fail alone and have it be my fault. The bottom line, I was starting to see that my work was my main basis of meaning and identity. It had become a way to distinguish myself from others and prove to the world that I'm really special. Failure was revealing all this. So what did I do? I offered my time at my church in California to help start a ministry for people who'd been laid off. It was a good thing to do, but underneath it, at my heart level, I hoped I could get 100 people find a job, to find a job to sort of make up for the 100 people I'd had to lay off. I was working extra hard to redeem myself. You can tell from what I've just shared that I needed some time with God. Jacob wrestled with God, and I studied that story. You may remember that Jacob was on his way back home after a couple decades of working with this guy who kept uh, changing the rules and going back on his promises. Eventually, God told Jacob to go back to the land he'd fled from when he'd sold his, stolen his brother's birthright. So Jacob loaded up everything, his livestock and his wives, and headed home. But understandably, he was a bit anxious that his older brother wouldn't be so happy to see him. So he tried to buy his brother's favors, sent along gifts of livestock and all kinds of things. But he still spent a really rough night alone, physically wrestling with God. He wrestled with God until God broke his hip. And even then, he held on until finally God said, you know, it's morning. Could we stop this? But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. God not only blessed him, but gave him a new name, Israel, and a new future. I think God invites us to wrestle with him. And we wrestle over blessing, too. Like Jacob, I took all my accomplishments and my failures, my hopes and my fears, into this time of wrestling with God. But I was really stuck by 
the whole part about God breaking Jacob's hip. In essence, he told Jacob he'd bless him, but he also made it clear who was in charge. His wounded hip was a lifelong reminder of God's sovereignty and power. God was telling him to lead, but with a limp. I could liken my failures to a limp. They'll always be there, but God can still use me as he sees fit. He can even still bless me as he sees fit. My wrestling time with God enabled me to see the depths of my brokenness, my blame shifting, my excuse making, my drivenness. I saw how much I was trying to make a name for myself and establish my own self-worth. At this point, I was eager for the gospel to change me deep inside. And that leads us to the hope part of the story. We all want to understand what it means when Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We want the freedom, peace, and joy of an identity that rests in Christ and what he accomplished on the cross. I learned that the gospel wasn't going to change me until I owned my failures and my limp, both work-wise and spiritually. And furthermore, I learned I could stop trying to redeem myself because I'd already been redeemed. Of course, I'd much rather be standing here as that CEO who had turned a struggling company around and sold the company for 10x and you know, could give God all the glory. Instead, I'm here before you as the failure case study who God nonetheless uses. He continues to use me as a broken, weak person leading with a limp. I continue to succumb to the same old idolatries and need to repent again and again and again. From that repentance, God then fills me up again and again and again. I hope you see failure is a time to deeply connect with God. It's a time to dig deeper, to try and understand the idols and the fears and the selfishness that drives us. It's a time to take stock and reorient us, ourselves to God's sovereignty and love. Personally, I wasn't sure what I'd do next after I'd wrestled with God. I was praying for God to show me an opportunity, and I never could have imagined when the call from Redeemer showed up. They asked me to come back to New York City to start a marketplace ministry. I didn't really want to leave Menlo Park, California for New York City. And I didn't really want to work for so little money. And I really didn't want to work at a church. All my idols of power and status and money were rearing their ugly heads again. But I was a little bit more ready for them, and I started to realize that I did sort of want to do what God wanted me to do, whatever it was, more than I wanted to do anything else. I wasn't sure the church job was it, but I was willing to fight against being driven by my idols. Eventually, I accepted the offer. Starting in 2002, I had 10 exciting years of trying to keep up with God, who was starting this marketplace ministry at Redeemer. We call it the Center for Faith and Work, and by all accounts, it has been an extraordinary success. But my experience with failure has taught me something about success, too. If God is sovereign over my failures, he's also sovereign over success. I want to be good, as good at credit giving as I've been at blame shifting. All success that is worthwhile is God's doing, and he uses everyone involved with all of our limps to make it happen for his purposes. Honest wrestling with failure helps us be honest about success. It's not about us. 
Until the time when his kingdom comes to earth, God will use failure to refine us in the crucible of work. We've been called to work in a broken world as broken, limping people. Even the most loving, morally beautiful people in the world fall prey to motives of self-interest, fear, and glory-seeking. But by accepting our brokenness, we're forced to keep going back to God to remember what we can't do on our own. This is the heart of the freedom of the gospel. This is the foundation of Jesus' promises that his yoke is easy. Repentance yields grace, and grace invites change. When I meditate on what Jesus has done for me on the cross, atoning for all my sins, and when I remember that actually now he's standing before the throne of the universe on my behalf, I begin to see how valuable I am to him. Slowly, Jesus begins to change my identity. I have a glimpse of that now. The other things in my work life, my resume, my influence, my perks, they start to become just things. I can risk them. I can spend them. I can even lose them to serve Jesus, the one who said to his father, for your sake, thy will be done. Thank you.